For those that are into fitness, you probably recognize this. It is a PE scale, perceived exertion scale. And it comes in quite handy if you don't have any sort of device to, to track that kind of information. And it's, it's really good um, uh, to help monitor how um, much a person is exerting themselves on a particular activity. But it differs for every person. So let's say a bunch of us went outside and we did a one mile run. At the end of that one mile, some of you, the more fit ones, may sit there and say, that was a, I feel like I was a number three. That was a very light activity. Um, some of us might say, okay, it was more like a six. And some, it may have been a very, very hard activity, 10. All did the same activity, and we all have a perceived exertion uh, uh, scale that's a little bit different. Now, take that concept and apply it to how we as individuals feel about privacy and security. So we have a, a scale here from zero to three. So zero is zero tolerance. This is somebody that has no trust in the system and they are living off the grid. For those of you that are Tom Hanks um, uh, fans, he, you might remember his movie Castaway, where he was on an island and he was all by himself, completely off the grid, not by his choice, um, but he had one little friend, it was that little volleyball called uh, Wilson, right? Um, now, on the other end, we have high tolerance. And that is somebody that is just going to live my life out loud, and I don't care who knows about it. And we know some of those people. Now, back on Tom Hanks, there's a movie that has been put out this last year called The Circle, based on a book uh, written by Dave Eggers. And that took the other extreme, and uh, the lead character played by Emma Stone, she worked for a company that is kind of like the combination of Google and Facebook, and she became very transparent. She was a three. She wore a camera around everywhere. And so what was interesting is she decided personally that she was going to be a three. By wearing the camera, anybody that came into her view was part of her world. Those people may not have been threes. Those people might have been twos or ones. And you have to kind of take that into consideration. And then when you think about it just for yourself, you know, a lot of you guys are in the security field. If you look at what is your perceived tolerance for when it comes to privacy and security issues, some of you may say you're a one or a two. And it might be the same both professionally and personally. But for me, it's, it's a little bit differently. On the professional side, um, I am a little bit more out there. You can learn a lot about my professional life. I don't keep that as private. I don't try to lock myself down in that area. But on the personal side of my life, that's what it is. It's my personal life, and I am more locked down. So my perceived tolerance when it comes to privacy and security changes depending upon you know, what, what I am doing. So with that, I am Tamara Dahl, and I am the Director of Emerging Technologies, and I'm on a uh, team called SAS Best Practices. Um, uh, I work with SAS Institute, some of you might be familiar with that. I am on a team, we're a thought leadership team, and we talk about um, best practices, not for SAS products, but for data and analytics and how they are impacting our lives. And I always argue that I have the best job on the team because I get to talk about emerging technologies. And what I stay focused on is big data, um, I'm just gonna call it data, internet of things, open source and how that works with the, the commercial software. And then what really excites me is talking about all of the privacy and security issues that have arisen because of some of these emerging uh, data issues. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer three questions from an individual's perspective. Let me go through the questions. Are privacy and security two sides of the same coin, like I've said? And how has data uh, impacted this discussion? And what can we do as individuals? Now, I have basically, if I want to keep on track, um, 15 minutes to go through 25 more minutes of a presentation. I am going to go, I'm going to get it down to 15 minutes, get it uh, back on track. 
And the reason I am doing that is because I, I like to be a respecter of time. But secondly, at 12 o'clock, I am doing part two of this presentation. It's the same title, but I'm going to be tackling these questions from an organization's perspective, not from the individual. So let's go ahead and move on because I only have 15 minutes. So question one. It all, for me, it all started with the, the whole big data thing that, that popped up in 2011. Everywhere we started hearing about big data. And for those of us that have been in the data world, um, we, we kind of woke up and it's like, where did all this big data come from? Because it's just like, I've been working with data for a really long time. And we learned that big data was not new. And we learned that it was the technologies. We now have technologies that allowed us to store and process this data um, a lot more cheaply and a lot more fast um, than what we've been doing in the past. And so that's where that whole thing took place. But then you started seeing a lot of conversations about privacy versus security. Now, as an individual, I can be an individual as a consumer, I can be a citizen, I can be an employee, I can be a student. I have a bunch of different hats that I wear, and I wear them at the same time. For me as an individual, it's not a privacy versus security. For me, it's, they're two sides of the same coin. So, let me take a look at a very simplistic, just think about the everyday Joe, the everyday Jane, when they think about privacy and security. You, when you listen to the media, people actually use these terms synonymously. Um, sometimes when they are talking about privacy, they're talking about security and vice versa. When I'm thinking about security, I'm thinking about what I need to do to maintain the perimeters, what I want to keep out. That can be a physical uh, barrier, such as my home, or it could be a business. Now, the, again, the idea is keeping things out. Privacy, on the other hand, is I have now got my border secured, and I'm going to let things in. Now, once things are in, what do I have access to? So in the case of a home, I can go ahead and secure my perimeters. I can put surveillance cameras around it. I can put an alarm system to secure my home. But then I have control over who enters that home and who can see and do what in that home. I can even control like the windows and doors and which is open and who can see in and who cannot see out. When it comes to privacy as an individual, I tend to have more control over that in some cases um, than others. Security outside of my home, when we're talking about computer networks, when I'm talking about businesses, I have no control over that security and how secure a thing is. Now the reason I bring this up is because globally we can all agree that we are going through an age of digital transformation. This globe, everybody is changing and we're becoming more digital. I like to think about it as going from an analog state and we are slowly migrating to a digital state. Now, you know, and we're trying to figure that out. And all of us are on this journey, and we're at different points. And in our jobs, we may be at a certain point. In our personal lives, we may be a, a little bit further. It's kind of interesting. I mean, when I was packing to come on here, I'm from Los Angeles, um, I brought my analog watch. Now, granted, I do have a smartwatch, and I do have a Fitbit, and I like wearing it and stuff, but I found that some of my things that I've got all the way over here, I miss over here, and I had to wear you know, my analog watch. But this is the decisions that we're having to make. We're also going from dumb, from everything in, in our lives happened to be dumb, and now we're moving to smart. So we had a dumb watch, and now we have smart watches. We have dumb homes, and we made a smart home. One of my things, one of my pet projects that I've done in the last year or two is uh, it took 14 months, but remodeled a home, and I took that dumb home and made it smart while still making it look dumb. And so that was quite the challenge. But the whole idea is we are all watching our cities, our cars, everything is going from dumb to smart. When it comes to privacy and security, what's kind of interesting is that the privacy and security discussions up until the last five or six years have largely been reserved for the professionals, for the security geeks, for the privacy freaks and everything. That was their thing. But as we've been going from analog to digital, from dumb to smart, 
What is happening is that privacy and security discussion and some of those issues that these professionals have been dealing with on a daily basis are now being passed to the amateurs. They are being passed to people like me, people that have to go and figure out how am I going to quantify myself with my things that I'm putting on me? What about my smart home? What about smart cities? There are more amateurs having to get involved and they're having to figure out, is, is these things that I am bringing into my life so that I can be more digital, so I can be more smart, are they secure? Are they going to protect me? So how has big data changed this discussion? So you guys are very familiar if you're in the security. This is a data life cycle. There's six common stages. You create it, store it, use it, share it, archive it, and destroy it. And let's start with create. Data privacy and security begins at the point of creation or collection. That seems like such a duh statement, but of course. But we are generating data at, at great volumes. They say that 70% of all the data that's being developed or created right now is being developed by we, the consumers. We are doing it. We are creating it. As soon as it's created, that's when data privacy and security issues have to kick in. If you don't create it, it's, you don't have to worry about it. But if you, um, and you, it can't be used um, against you and it cannot be abused. Now when it comes to uh, storage, when an organization asks for your information and they store your data, it becomes their responsibility, not yours, to secure and protect it from corruption, destruction, interception, loss, or unauthorized access. So somebody, you give your information, it's their responsibility, it's not yours. Now on the privacy side, it all depends. There is no global privacy regulations. There are, depends on what country you're in, depends on what industry you're in. There are different levels of things. Now, yes, the, the key word of today is GDPR. And Europe is doing a really good job in leading the effort and, and doing something that no other country has done. The United States has not done a great job. We, we do make efforts and stuff, but there is no global effort on the, on the privacy. And as I, I was talking about earlier, it's not an easy thing because we all have different perceived tolerances. We have different um, contexts and things that are okay for me, what would be okay for me, may not be okay for you, and we have to deal with that. We have different cultures as well. When it comes to use, this is an example of Facebook's, um, from their, their terms of service, and they talk about on this thing um, how they are going to use your data. When I joined Facebook back in 2008, I, I agreed to some terms of service and privacy policy that I, I will admit I did not read, and I can promise you probably most no one read it. Um, but I know that it's changed a lot since 2008. I don't currently use Facebook, but they are being forced to talk about how they use it. But what's interesting to note is in this data life cycle thing, that people are more concerned about how you, the company, are going to use their data than they are about the collection or the storage of it. Now, because of, a, of our, our so, of social media, if you put it on the internet, it's not a question of if, but when your information may be used in unintentional ways. And, you know, so this is, this is good when you're talking about the internet. But there's some things that you don't put on the internet and this, your data can be used against you. And, you know, the, the greatest example, the most recent one, is with Equifax and the credit reporting agency. The, the, the frustrating thing, being a U.S. citizen and having this done, um, is that is a third party to me, the consumer. I have no direct control. I didn't give my information to Equifax. Equifax, they have brought it in from other sources, and what they do is they allow me to ask, what do you know about me? It's called my credit report. If I disagree with something, I can tell them, hey, that's not right, and, and then I can you know, put in some, um, a claim, and, and hopefully it will be corrected. But I have no control over that. 
And so then they do not secure their system, and now, you know, up to half of, you know, uh, American uh, citizens have been exposed. Now, they gave you a site to go to to find out, hey, were you one of the ones that were, were caught? But you know what? I don't trust that site enough to go and put in my information to do it because I don't know where it's going. So I didn't put my stuff on the inter internet for Equifax, but clearly there has been a, a breach. Archive. The more data an organization stores in archives, the more data for which it's responsible and the more it knows about you. So again, when I was talking about big data, when it came, what it allowed us to do is with these technologies, it allowed us to store a whole lot more data and process it a lot faster at just a fraction of the cost. And so companies were now being given the opportunity to store a lot more data for a lot longer. And, you know, and the more they do that, the more of, of which they're responsible. But on the, on the flip side of that, it's also a really good thing um, for people to do it. Because there is a, a company out there, and it's one of the, the, the larger ones, is, is Amazon. They've been collecting data on each of its customers since day one. And they're proud of the fact that they have never thrown away any data. And so because of that, because they have access to all of the data, they are able to continue to improve on their services and can expand from a digital bookseller to, you know, I'm trying to sell everything. You know, back in the day, back in 2001 is when I became a customer, they were trying to figure out that product recommendation. And it was kind of clunky. You could go in and kind of put your input into it. But they figured it out. They got human input. Then they um, taught the machines. Now the machines do it. And now that whole product recommendation thing that they figured out back in the early 2000s, you will see it on most retail type sites. And if they don't have it, it's like, you know, what's wrong with you? Now, let's fast forward to today. Because they have all of this data, they've been collecting data on me for what, uh, 16 years. They have what's, um, they're talking about, it's what's called anticipatory shipping. Their, their hypothesis is that they know you better than you know yourself and they are going to ship you that thing before you even click on the buy button. The reality of it is, is that they are watching what you're doing and what you want to buy and stuff like that, and you may not have clicked buy, but they know you. And so what they're going to do is, they're going to take a guess on what you're going to buy, and they're going to make sure that that thing is in the distribution center closest to your home. So as soon as you click buy, you can get it within a couple of hours. It's very, very different. And the only reason they can do it is because they are 100% data driven. Um, for those that are involved with IoT, I highly recommend a book called The Amazon Way on IoT. It shows how they use their data and analytics to, to move things forward. And they not have only collected all this data on each of us to drive forward their business. Think about where most of their revenue comes from. It comes from AWS, from their ability to allow other people to store their data with them. And then when it comes to destruction, when you delete an account, you don't know what data was deleted or destroyed, you could still become a data breach victim. That's the thing. We have signed up for hundreds of accounts. We've downloaded lots and lots of apps, and we have shared that personal information. And then we sit there and we go through a cleanup and we say, you know what, I want to delete my account. You can go ahead and uninstall an app and you can delete an account, but you have no idea what that organization has done with your data after that. All you know is that you don't have access to your account from your app or for uh, online. But depending upon which company it is, you will have to figure out you know, where that, you know, how much of the data they actually have. So if a breach comes to a company where you've deleted an account, you could still be a victim because your, your data has been archived and it was never deleted. And for some reason, for some things, for depending upon your industry, financial industry, healthcare industry, you know, a company has to hold on to information for X number of years. But are they doing that or are they storing it for longer? Okay, what can we do as individuals? Okay, until we have our IoT facts labels, do your homework. So the question is, what is the IoT facts label? That is a teaser for my next session. 
I did um, a, a keynote at IoT Slam uh, this summer, and it was a fun one. I, I called it, uh, is the IoT cool, creepy, or just plain wrong? And what I proposed was this IoT facts label. And um, the general manager from AWS IoT, um, she's encouraging me to send it to the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission in the US, and uh, see if we can get this going. So I'll, I'll talk about that in the next section. But when I talked about earlier that I have uh, went through this, this long, laborious task of making my dumb home smart, I learned that that was a very, very painful exercise because all I really have is all of the marketing on the packaging and I can sit there and I can say, okay, with my lighting and my music and I can go ahead and coordinate all of these, these things don't always talk to each other. They don't talk to each other well. Some of these things are more secure than others. I, I learned that the, the first surveillance camera set that I got when there was the Mirai attack I, I sat there and I thought, wow, did my cameras play a part in that? And, and I'm sitting there going, wow, I don't even remember. I've got IP cameras. Did I even change the password? And so I went to my system and I had 11 cameras and I had to, it took me about a half hour to find out where the passwords were for each of the cameras. And then I had to go and basically do 25 clicks per camera to change that password. So I was kind of on the, the, the manufacturer and I was like, you know, this is not fair, this is not right, you cannot make this so difficult. Um, but the whole point is, is that when we are starting to go from analog to digital, when we're trying to go from dumb to smart, these things are coming into our lives. And we have to understand, I mean, are they going to secure us or do I still need my watchdog? Is it a bladder mouth? Is it going to protect me? Um, and how well does it play with others? It's that interoperability uh, discussion. The one thing that you have to keep in mind is now is not the time to be apathetic or ignorant about these discussions. It's not a sustainable position. We are in a digital transformation. The Internet of Things is coming. We are moving from dumb to smart and we need to be smart about the decisions that we are making as individuals, as consumers, as citizens, as employees, as students. Today's tech is making us all nerds, and, but we just need to be cool about it. So if it seems too good to be true, so there's a bunch of crowdfunding um, sites that allow you to go and support different projects. Um, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, those are two that I, I support. Um, I love supporting innovation. Um, but I can tell you, right now I've got seven open projects that have been going on for one, two, two years, and I'm still waiting for them to come through. Um, for the most part, um, I'm, I'm pleased with the outcome and the products that I get and the things that I've invested in. There was one that was called Titan Note. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, they were on Indiegogo. You take this little device, looks like a little Echo Dot. You could take it anywhere with you. I could put it right here, and it will record everything that is going on. And then afterwards, it would transcribe the notes. And if there were different speakers, it would, note, it would indicate the different speakers in your notes and stuff. And then it would go ahead and clean it up, and then you could email them out and everything like that. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Um, got a note, Indiegogo, cancel the project, you know, and there was no explanation. Well, Titan Note people, they got really upset. They went to another crowdfunding site that I didn't know. They sent it out and they said, Indiegogo is bad, you know, go over here. As soon as you clicked over here, these guys had shut them down too. And the whole thing came down to the privacy and security of this, this device. They're still trying to get it out there. So if it seems too good to be true, it might be. Big Brother is so 1984. It's not about Big Brother. We have big companies. We've got the Facebooks. We've got the Googles and everything. But we've also got the people that are sitting right next to us that have phones and stuff. I was at a, a, a conference for LA. The, the mayor had put on a, a conference. And I was on a panel. And we were talking about privacy and security. And we're talking about smart cities. And afterwards, this gal came up to me. Her name was Dee. And she said, she goes, you know what? I have tried to live a very private life, and I don't really care what the government knows about me. And I don't you know, participate in the social channels and stuff. But what I'm afraid of is that person walking next to me on the street is going to go, and I'm going to be part of some picture, and I'm going to be on Facebook. And I have no choice, and I have no control over that. That's what she was afraid of. Now, when, with all these things that are coming into our life, 
If you don't know what it's all about, you need to ask a nerd of your nerd. You just need to do it. Now, there's probably a hand, you know, probably a lot of you are probably nerds in here and stuff. But think about the people in your life that are not as nerdy as you. Make sure that they are protecting themselves. And we cannot sit there and hide behind. We have nothing to hide. We all have, no we all have something to hide. We're all human, so, you know, get rid of that little excuse. Now, check your things and then check again. This little checklist, change your passwords, encrypt it all, update your software. I'm telling you what, any story that comes out of a data breach or a big issue coming out, I can, I can promise you it's because one or more of these things are true. Default passwords were not changed, and so hackers were able to get in. You didn't update your software. Equifax, that was a patch. It, they didn't update their software. You need to do it. I found out just on Saturday that my company has, you know, the laptop that they've given me, they blocked it down really well, and I didn't find out until 10 minutes before I was supposed to go online for a virtual conference. And their IT department was trying to work with me, and they found out that my laptop does not allow any um, platform to come in and use my camera, use my mic, or anything like that. Well, I'm glad I've got a really nice secure device, and oh yeah, I remember reading an email about it, but I didn't find out you know, how severe that was until I had to go. And so I had to cancel my session online and I wasn't able to, to move forward. But you guys all understand this. Change your passwords, encrypt it all, update your software. I know you're all doing it, but make sure the people around you are doing it as well. And saying it won't happen to me, you know that is not true. So, final. We all know better. We know these things that I'm talking about as individuals, and we each have a role to play. But again, I'm going to drive home the point. Take care of your family. Make sure that they are being protected. Take care of your friends. Take care of your customers. Take care of your community. Take it outside of yourself and share it with others. And with that, it's a big digital world out there, so do your part to keep it safe. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. Now, uh, any questions from the audience? Okay, okay. But I still got one, just one tiny one. Okay. Now, back in the 50s, we as individuals, we did nothing, I mean, we did nothing amazing. We still went to kindergarten, we still took pictures, we still drove to work, we, we, we you know, Today we do the same things. We still take pictures, da 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 da. So, so I would I would rather say it's not us as individuals that are you know we're not creating more data. There's just more data gathered than us. So we as individuals we don't okay we maybe take a little bit more pictures and, and do some stupid things. But but you you get the point. Yeah, I get the point. What we're what we're doing though is we are sharing a lot more with. So any, any post, you know, any picture that you're sharing and all that, you're continuing to expose yourself, and it's that kind of data. And then that data gets shared. There's your retweets and that network effects. That it just keeps on getting proliferated. So one little post of yours can go out and keep on going, and people try to leave it, and they can't. You know, and there's some, some sad consequences. The 70%, um, I have challenged that uh, as well and stuff. But we are, because it's so easy for us to do it with our mobile devices, we are creating a lot more data. So, you know, is it 70%? You know, that is questionable. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Tamara. Okay. Now, uh, here's a little one, a certificate for you. Thank you very much for your fantastic keynote. Nice little souvenir from my side. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, nice applause.